Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, there will be a lot of material in here because it's an overview and I, I know exactly that I will run out of time. So uh, what do I have, 50 minutes, 45 minutes? Okay, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to, to pack as much as I can, but it's fairly modular so we can, we can uh, it's, it's, it's more pleasant for me if I know that you're following along than getting through the whole material. So please interrupt me if there's something uh, you don't understand or where I'm un unclear. Uh, also, a quick show of hands. Uh, how many biologists? Uh oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> how many card carrying computer scientists? That is, people who do not, who do computer science that does not touch on biology explicitly. Okay, so we'll, we'll, uh, okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll proceed. Uh, I think I have the slides at that, at that level. Um, Better. Okay. So, uh, I think this is an appropriate quotation because this chap was running around here in Cambridge uh, and uh, he pointed out that to understand a sentence means to understand a language, but to understand a language means to be master of a technique. And uh, these are really the people who have developed the technique that I'm uh, giving you an overview of. Uh, this is uh, Vincent Danos, a uh, uh, widely known computer scientist uh, in Edinburgh. And you have uh, met him, I'm sure he has been a frequent visitor here. Uh, Jean Crivin, he's now at uh, CNRS in Paris, at PPS. Uh, he was formerly at, uh, in my lab. Uh, Jerome Ferré, he is at INRIA now. Uh, he also uh, spent two years in my lab. Russ Harm is currently in my lab, but he will be returning to CNRS. Uh, and Eric Dietz is a biophysicist, a postdoc in my lab, who now moved on to be a professor at the University of Kansas. So these four people are really the architects of most of what I'm saying. Um, <clears throat> just to give the, 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 the computer scientists sort of a rough idea of the domain that I'm dealing with, uh, is I, I, I sketched this cartoon. Uh, we're, we're interested in information processing inside living cells. So uh, what does that roughly look like? Well, here you have a cell, and the cell is delimited by a membrane. Uh, there is a neighboring cell, and then there is some space in between cells. A cell has uh, complicated objects embedded in its membrane. These are proteins, uh, or also called receptors. They're receptors because in this... Uh, medium between the cells, there are many different molecules that uh, get into that medium by being uh, expelled or extruded by other cells, and they attach to these receptors. So these receptors are sensors, in a way, that detect the presence of these molecules. Uh, when they detect the presence of these molecules, a number of things happen. They combine, uh, these receptors bind to one another, and something inside happens on the portion of these receptors inside the cell happens that attracts other uh, components uh, of which there are many. Uh, a lot of, uh, of processing occurs and uh, one component modifies another component which then in turn can modify yet another component and so on. There's activity that spreads throughout the medium until certain molecules inside the cell nucleus are being activated and they start uh, directing the transcription and then translation of genes and new components as a result of being produced. Uh, the consequences of that is that some of these components lead the cell to change its behavior. It could start changing its shape, it could start to move, it could start to become a different cell, becoming a liver cell, a neuron, or a kidney cell. Uh, and uh, some of these components, however, that are being regenerated uh, by the genome are actually components that already exist inside the cell and therefore uh, change now the constitution of this entire sort of molecular society that processes signals. So that's sort of roughly speaking, uh, the, you know, from 700,000 feet, uh, the, the kind of, uh, of uh, 
of phenomena I'm particularly interested in. So that's just a tiny slice of molecular cell biology and even a tinier slice of biology as a whole, obviously. Okay, so for you to, uh, who are not familiar sort of with, uh, with the names, what does systems biology really mean? Uh, I would like to make a distinction between systematic biology and systems biology. So systematic biology is um, a way of approaching biology that exploits uh, progress in high throughput technologies uh, that enable uh, the collection of massive data sets in parallel. They enable us to monitor many of these processes I was talking about before, many of these molecular interactions at the same time in the cell. This is a massively distributed system and so you can monitor several of these uh, interactions at the same time uh, and then follow them through time longitudinally. Uh, you can also sequence massively genomes at a large scale. So this is what I mean by high throughput. Uh, that has given, given us a deluge of data, of course, that in turn required uh, computer science to come on the stage to help us organize that, those data sets in sort of nifty libraries and to navigate that data. I'm coming back to that in a moment. But at the same time, so one, there is also sort of the need to put all these data together into a coherent picture and understand really how does coherent system behavior arise from a massively distributed um, a collection of individually interacting processes or molecules in this case. So that's where mathematics comes into play. So systems biology really uh, brings, uh, um, uh, emphasizes the need to integrate experimentation with more formal and mathematical approaches to help us understand the dynamics of these systems. Uh, and the reason why, of course, we want to do this is twofold. One, simply practical, because we want to cure disease at the, in the end. And for that, we need to know how these systems work. This is, in some sense, a program, as it were. We will come back to that, uh, that we don't know exactly whose source code we don't know quite precisely. But we, we know it has a bug, it has a disease, and we want to, uh, to fix it. Uh, so we need to have proximate models of that program, of that actual program, to uh, proceed in a more reasoned and rational way than just by trial and error. But then also intellectually, and in the end we want to have means to think the complexity of a cell, and uh, just then staring at all this data. Uh, and for that we need sort of suitable levels of abstractions and formalisms. Good. Uh, what has really changed uh, in the past couple of years is that the kind of data that has been collected in the past 30 years, perhaps, has been predominantly data of a static type. Gene sequences, AUGC, or ATAGC, and so forth, uh, or uh, protein structures. So the, the, the spatial layout of a big molecule. These are static data types. And they're, all, all, they're almost a born formally, because a sequence is a sequence. There's not much to formalize there. A uh, set of x, y, z coordinates is already formalized. Uh, what has happened more recently with increasing intensity, partly because of technological developments, is, uh, the, <coughs> is an appearance of facts or factoids of this kind. Let me read this, because you might not be able to read it at the end. But it gives you sort of a... Um, a sense of what we're up against as, as computer scientists. So instead of getting se gene sequences or instead of getting protein structures, we're getting increasingly statements, empirical statements of the kind. A phosphoepitope of EGFR binds strongly to the SH2 PTP domains of GRAB2, NIC1, PI3, kinase alpha, and weakly to the SH2 domains of GRAB10, GRAB7, NIC2, SHIP1, I mean, this is, to me, alphabet soup, and probably to you too. Uh, so these are sort of, what I intend to say, these are broad statements. The first statement is a very broad statement. It says that a particular protein, a particular piece of a protein, can recognize a lot of other things. Okay? Uh, then there are sort of somewhat biochemically deeper statements that add much more detail, like axin-1 binds a region in the armadillo repeat of beta-catenin if beta-catenin is unphosphorylated at certain end-terminal residues. 
It also sounds like alphabet soup, but in essence what it is saying is that a certain event occurs if certain conditions on a molecule are, uh, are, are the case. It's important to, and we have gazillions, so thousands and thousands of such facts. Postdocs spend their entire, um, the entire postdoctoral uh, period on, on figuring out one or a few of these facts. What is important about all of them is to realize that they are in some sense fragmentary because each of these facts is local in the sense that it, it is a statement about aspects of a molecule and aspects of a molecule that are engaged in interaction but not a statement about the entire state of the molecule. It's fragmentary, it's local. And because they're local, you can start thinking of them as little puzzle pieces that can be plugged together because one statement might refer to one part of the molecule, another statement might refer to another part of the molecule. So they start weaving potentially huge networks of possible interactions. So this is the kind of, of uh, schematic or that, that would attempt to summarize many such statements. What is important to understand, so what, what, what do you see in this diagram? What you see is uh, some, uh, each of these nodes is a protein, these nodes are decorated with a number of other aspects that, that emphasize different sites and domains or parts of the protein that have to be in certain states in order for uh, these uh, edges, which symbolize interactions, to occur. What is important to understand about these networks is that unlike road networks, these are not physical networks. Uh, these are networks of possibility. Uh, these are networks that where you know, this interaction here is possible. But it may only occur if a number of things happen before. So it's not that such a network, if you were to look inside a cell, you would see such a network like you would see a, 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 a wiring diagram when you look at the chip of a computer. No, this is just a network of possible interactions. What actually occurs in a cell is a constantly shifting realization of parts of this network. So this goes, therefore, without saying. Uh, that we, we can't stare at these pictures and make a lot of sense of them unless we begin to think of them dynamically. Because it's not just a dynamics on the network, like you would have a traffic flow on a road network, on a fixed physical road network. I mean, that's dynamic too, because you need to understand how the flows of, uh, of, of cars and so forth um, uh, interact with one another. This is even worse. This is fear, sir, in a sense, because this is a dynamics... Um, off the network as well. So uh, this, to me, seems to, to put to the fore a kind of a challenge as to what kinds of models are appropriate to reason about these, these objects. So I will briefly talk about a scientific challenge. I'll try to characterize in the next couple of minutes a scientific challenge or aspects of a scientific challenge that I think we're facing, a knowledge representation cha uh, challenge, but at the same time, I believe that all of these are embedded in what I would call a, a communication challenge. The problem for us becomes increasingly to communicate biological knowledge, and I think models in the future will slightly shift their role, their social role, and while we want models to be, of course, predicting devices. Devices that tell me, ah, uh, if I interfere with this particular receptor, then these and these are the quantitative consequences five minutes later, ten minutes later, and so on. So we would like, ultimately, models really to be quantitatively predictive so that we can, we can sort of make rational drug design. But for a model to become quantitatively predictive, predictive about the kinds of networks that have the complexity I showed you before, it's sort of a long cycle to get there. And so the question is, are models, until they get predictive, not useful because they will make wrong quantitative predictions? And of course, that's not the case. Uh, models will become increasingly, as I hope to show you, uh, they will adopt the role of helping us organize, in some sense, this, uh, this, uh, this deluge of facts about interaction. They are kind of, uh, they're, we, we can't just list those facts, we need to have sort of more dynamic ways of organizing them, of evaluating them, even if they're not quantitatively predictive. So models become vehicles for the
the communication of biological knowledge. And uh, they should come kind of open source documents, very much like a program, like an open source program. They should be able to be um, communicated, distributed, and developed by many people simultaneously. Uh, they need to be they need to track knowledge. Facts in biology are unstable. Tomorrow, what you know tomorrow may not be the same, maybe hopefully more than what you know today, but maybe it will, it will, uh, it will uh, disavow what you know today. And so facts change, and models need to track those facts. That is a, is a tall order. So I believe in, in, the, in, the, in the future of biology, it is not databases as we know them today that are going to be uh, critical, mission critical, uh, in a sense of databases containing sort of static facts, but uh, it will databases of sort of model bases. We will have large collections of models that uh, will be used to communicate, store, and retrieve biological information. So that's sort of the pitch uh, overall. Um, <clears throat> so what's the scientific challenge? The scientific challenge is combinatorial complexity, and I can make this very quick because you all are familiar with this phenomenon clearly from uh, your own domain in computer science. Uh, by combinatorial complexity, I mean that a protein typically has many, many sites at which it can be modified. So if it has three bits at which it can be in two different states, you already have eight possible modification forms of that protein. The receptors I, were talking, I was talking about before have typically 10 or more modification sites. So it's 1,024 different states for a receptor, if it dimerizes, if it combines with another receptor, uh, then uh, you already have, the dimer has a million different states. And uh, you have just described a tiny little piece, uh, piece of interaction. In fact, you've described just one interaction. So complex formation compounds this combinatorial complexity. Another thing that is important to, um, for combinatorial complexity to, to reach through is concurrency. That is, it's not enough to have three different sites that you can modify if you can modify, only in, if you can modify them only in a particular order. First site one, and when you have modified site one, then site two becomes modifiable, then site three becomes modifiable, and so on. Uh, because that would just cut sort of one particular path through the space of possible modifications. You need concurrency, you need independence. And that independence is uh, warranted if we are to believe the data we have today, to some degree, uh, for sure. So why is this combinatorial complexity important? Well, for one, let me just drive home the message even further. If we look at a tiny piece of this map, uh, then uh, this is not a random number. This is really a number that we calculated for a particular uh, snippet of this, uh, of this diagram. You easily get into astronomic numbers like 10 to the 19th different uh, molecular species that you would have to track. Now, if you were to do this with standard uh, methods in which you have to a priori, sort of extensional methods in which you have to a priori specify all the possible uh, uh, molecular objects that can occur because you have to write out a differential equation, for example, for each one of them that sort of tallies up the production and the consumption, then you're out of business because you just can't do that. Uh, so what people then do is uh, they, they simplify. Well, there are two ways of approaching the problem. One is to say, well, I'm, we're not really interested in, uh, in mechanistic aspects. We're just, uh, we just want to black box or gray box the whole system uh, and uh, uh, identify it with a phenomenological input-output function and throw machine learning techniques at it in order to, to, to see how this box behaves, but we're not opening the box, we're not looking inside. That's very valuable, certainly in many cases. Another possibility is just, just to make an ad hoc simplification. This is what most people do. They say, ah, oh, you know, all these different modification forms don't really matter. I collapse all these different uh, modification forms of a protein into just one uh, or in two modification forms, two states, active or inactive. But that's all done at hoc, so there is no general, uh, generality there. Now the problem here is, while useful in particular instances, the problem that I have with that is that combinatorial, first of all, we may have to reason at the mechanistic level, so we can't afford only proceeding phenomenologically, because after all, if we develop drugs, those drugs act at a particular molecular interaction level. So we need to be at that level. Secondly, perhaps more interestingly, 
is that this combinatorial complexity is ubiquitous. Now, something that is ubiquitous seems to me to indicate having a function of some sort, an evolutionary function, it's therefore reason, or a physiological function. What is uh, the, the function of combinatorial complexity? And we can't even ask, let alone answer that question, if we have models that throw out, that eliminated combinatorial complexity to begin with. So this is why, why we need to, to make models that are more respectful of it. To just give you a slight um, sort of cartoon of uh, what, uh, a, a small example of what that combinatorial complexity can do to you, this is sort of the equivalent, the molecular equivalent of what you might call deadlock. But it's not quite deadlock, it's more something jamming because in chemistry deadlock doesn't quite exist since you always have reversibility so you can retrace your steps. So it's more of a jamming. Uh, so suppose you have three agents, uh, each of which has two sites, agents A, B, C, and they want to form a triangle. They want to form a complex that is a ring. And such rings are extremely you know, widespread in the cell. So ring structures are you know, pores, uh, various, various um, the proteasome, a number of uh, uh, molecular machines contain rings for a lot of reasons that we can't go into right now. So you want to understand the assembly of such rings. So suppose now the interactions are really local so that A binds to B regardless of whether A is already bound to C and so on. So that the interaction is strictly, strictly uh, a binder between A and B, A and C, B and C and pertain only to that interaction. They don't look at the other sites that uh, the occupancy state of the other side that is not involved in the interaction. So if you put then a bunch of ABCs into a virtual beaker, and suppose they're all at the same concentration, otherwise further complexities arise. So there's the same number of A's, same number of B's, same number of C's. So you let them go. What happens is the following. Uh, this is time, and I have stretched it logarithmically to make the phenomenon a bit more clearer. Uh, at the beginning, you have a little lag so then the system starts, what I should say, which I should premise, which I forgot, is that every step is reversible. Binding and unbinding occur. So binding is reversible, except that when I have formed the triangle, I think of the triangle as an absorbing state. There are many thermodynamic reasons why that is the case. So once you form the triangle, it stays a triangle. So eventually, the whole system, the fraction of, of components in the triangular state, in the triangular complex, will go to one. Everything will end up there eventually. So we're at the moment just interested in how it ends up there. So at first, uh, you know, dimers combine and uh, we'll find um, another monomer to recruit into a triangle and everything, uh, and, and a certain fraction of triangles will emerge in the system. But then the system hits a plateau. On that plateau, it waits for a long time, and then sort of slowly it starts proceeding to completion. Now, what is this plateau about? Well, this plateau comes about because if A, if the pairwise interactions are very strong, if the molecules like one another very much, which I think you would you assume to be the case if we want to form efficiently triangles, then you will form these pairs, these dimers, A, C, B, C, A, B, but these are all puzzle pieces that can't, inter that can't interact with one, any uh, with one another anymore. So you have, you have you're deadlock because the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. You ended up with a state of, of uh, sort of everything progressed here along all possible paths in parallel, you know, exploiting the distributed nature of the system. But then they ended up, the system ends up occupying molecular forms that suddenly can't, can't interact with one you know, with each other anymore because AC can't interact with BC. So while A can bind that B, it would not be possible because we we constrain it to be a triangle. That is, the B would require then this this C and this C to clash because they want to be in the same space in the same in the same spot. So these two can't interact with one another for the same reason these two can't interact with one another, and you're stuck. You're stuck until one of these dimers dissociates liberating a monomer, which then can be captured by the other dimer, by a dimer to produce the triangle. So that's the version of deadlock. Uh, it's sort of interesting because you, you, you see that uh, there is a tension in the system. You could say, well, uh, what if I make my bonds 
weaker or stronger. If I make my bonds weaker, uh, then I will shorten the period of jamming up here because my molecules will, will dissociate quicker and liberating a monomer to proceed to the triangle. So I will shorten this period, but I will lengthen this lag phase because if my interactions are weak, it will take a long time until the first dimers form. Okay? On the other hand, so this is what you see here. Uh, these are weak bonds. As I, sorry, this, this, what, I, what you're seeing here is a plot of the time it takes for the whole system to get to 0.99. All right, so when I weaken the bonds, it takes, it, at some point things get worse because while I'm shortening, this, I'm shortening this phase, I'm lengthening this lag time. On the other hand, if I make bonds strong, then I shorten the lag here because the first discovery of the, the first triangles, of course, and the first dimers will form very quickly, but then I lengthen my jamming phase because dissociation will be slow. So again, the, uh, the time to completion, to full assembly, will increase. So there will be somewhere an optimum of the bond strength at which these two trends are, uh, are best compromised. Uh, and of course, needless to say, this is chemistry, so it all depends on the concentration for reasons, you know, that would deserve a talk on its own. Uh, anyhow, the, the, the reason I mention this example is just to sensitize you to the fact that when you have such systems, uh, you, you, and you, and you take into account all the pathways through which uh, these, uh, these molecules can interassemble with one another, uh, you, you, will find, you will find dynamical effects that seem to me potentially significant, but that you completely miss if you simplify the system by uh, saying, well, I'm not really interested in the, you know, I just assume that I have three monomers and with a certain rate they form triangles. You know, then you know, you, you're sort of glossing over a lot of detail and you're missing this kind of dynamics that might be quite important. Uh, and there's much more to say about that, but for an overview, I think this should, this should suffice. Um, representation, knowledge representation. Well, uh, clearly, you know, literally, these, these facts, these factoids about interaction between these proteins, I mean, these are, these, are, these, are, these are quotes from the literature. This is how we know them. So this is not, this is barely human readable. Uh, this is certainly not computer readable. You know, try to, to run a linguamatics over this stuff and you will get your surprises. Uh, so what we obviously need to do is somehow, as we did naturally, as was completely obvious to do with sequences and, and structures, we need to formalize these empirical factoids so that they become uh, a human readable, uh, but in particular so that they become computer readable. In particular, when we have formalized these kinds of statements, you, we, can, we can weave them together into models that are collections of such statements. Uh, in particular, those statements then can be, uh, this is something that I said already before, we need to keep in mind that the facts in biology are unstable, so it's not just combinatorial state that is a problem in representing uh, knowledge in this system, but also the fact that knowledge changes, evolves, and is scattered over many different laboratories. So what we need, I think, to, to address these two issues is we need a formal language to represent these factoids as, as local rules founded on abstraction of protein ana anatomy. Uh, these rules should be executable. I come to that in a second, much more concretely. Uh, we need mathematically sound and scalable tools to uh, investigate sets of such rules, which we will call models. And we need to develop a kind of web infrastructure for not only exhibiting and sharing these models, but also for uh, creating content through, by enticing a community of researchers, of biochemists, to deposit, to formalize such rules and to deposit them in rule databases. So we need a web infrastructure for the collation of rules. Uh, if models are sets of rules, then rules are essentially model elements. And if we had a large database of such formalized rules, uh, making models would, for one, become very easy to us, our colleagues at the bench, because it's all about sort of selecting which rules we want to put together, and you already have a model, 
plus initial conditions, etc. But you, 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 you would not have to start conceiving of a model, constructing a model every time from scratch. And in particular, your model could stay up to date because if, if it contains a rule that tomorrow is being modified because of new empirical evidence, you know, like in your software update, you know, maybe a window pops up and says, you know, your model has changed. There is a new rule that is available. Do you want to update your model? You know, version 5.63. So, so uh, this would be really useful. There's a whole other realm here that opens up, which is about, you know, what does it mean to publish a model? That's, uh, that's another, I think, very interesting aspect because uh, publishing models is, uh, is not the same as publishing text. Models want to be, in some sense, appletized. They want to be living documents that the uh, reader can interact with and explore, perhaps even a reviewer. So uh, that's, uh, that's a whole other, other can. So this is just summarizing again what I said. What we would like to have is formalized pools of such rules, of such empirical factoids. We want, we want to think models of models as being sets of rules. We want, models, we want to think of models as evaluating at every point um, a rule in the context of other rules, maybe a small context of other rules, so that we can understand how it conspires with, other, with the five other rules that interact with it in generating system behavior. So this is the role that models will have, uh, not just becoming predictive eventually, but be long before they are predictive, they become evaluators. They become, in some sense, debuggers. Truly, debuggers of rule sets. You know, to know whether a set of rules is meaningful, whether you didn't make a, uh, whether what you said is what you meant, uh, you need, in some sense, to put them together and have them play out with one another, have them play a little concert, and that is what models uh, will do. As a consequence, you will generate hundreds of models on a particular rule set in order to evaluate them. And I will call so this collection of models, all of which pertain to a set of rules that are specific to a a system of interest to a biologist, to a, to a cell cycle, for example, I call that an exploratorium. So it's to go away from the name, from the sort of label model, which is too, too burdened by what we mean by it in physics. This is what I mean by executable knowledge, therefore. So by making these empirical factoids about interaction formal, by providing arenas in which these formal interaction statements can interact with one another and therefore reveal in some sense directly what the data is about. Uh, I call executable knowledge and they do this in some sense in honor but also in distinction to uh, a sort of a classic paper by now I think by, by, executed by, uh, by Jasmine uh, and Tom Hensinger uh, who really sort of brought uh, uh, um, uh, a concept to the fore. The fact that we, that, that the whole idea of programs as models or models as programs, depending on how you want to see it, as distinct from sort of more, more traditional approaches of, uh, based on, say, differential equations and chemical kinetics. <clears throat> what, in fact, this whole, this whole, sorry for being a bit long-winded here, but I feel sort of some, a little bit of history is perhaps uh, warranted. This whole idea is not, did not originate with us. It has been around for quite a while, but it's interesting to see how it came from computer science to some extent, and it came from biology to some extent, but it never came fully to fruition for very interesting cultural reasons. On the one hand, computer scientists took off-the-shelf languages for representing these rules, and that's so th what they got right is, of course, that when you think of models as programs, you can, you can, you can use sort of 30 years of uh, computer science or more to bring sort of concurrency uh, to... Um, uh, to bear, to bring sort of model checking to bear, to bring uh, a program verification and so forth to bear, these kinds of techniques. Uh, that's what they understood, what the biologists, the computational biologists uh, did not understand. But on the other hand, they, 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 they felt they were more sort of uh, interested in, in showing that existing languages could be used to represent uh, this information uh, rather than redesigning a new language that is perhaps more in tune with how molecular biologists really think about these systems. That's what the biologists got right uh, when they tried to approach these, uh, these systems, but they had no clue of sort of the whole formal uh, uh, opportunities that this would open up. And so this led, in some sense, to, to uh, uh, false starts, uh, but, but interesting starts. But in the, in the end, starts that did sort of not fully sort of reach through, I believe, to the level of adoption that we would like to see to make this, to make this um, 
uh, take off. So now, uh, I'm way, way late. So give me, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just rush through a little bit uh, what this formalism consists in, what this language consists in. And again, mind you, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, it's not about all of biology. <laughs> all of biology is way too big. Uh, we are really interested in a language that is tightly focused on uh, these signaling processes. Okay, so it's a, it's a very specific interest we have. These signaling processes are important because they are underlying cancer. They are under, underlying sort of a lot of recalcitrant diseases. They are sort of the, the ep epitomizing information processing, but it's not the only thing that is happening in biology, of course. It's really just a tiny piece. Uh, but, you know, crawl, walk around. Uh, this is the world of structural biologists. They have different representations of their molecules, of course, so there are different levels of abstraction that biologists are using already when they think about their agents. Uh, this, is, um, this is how we think about an agent. Uh, so <laughs> you know, this, is, this is computer science, where uh, uh, a lot you know, of this, it's an agent, it has a name, it has sites, and these sites will then be defined in terms of how they can interact with other sites of other agents through rules. Uh, the rules will define those interactions. So what this should just drive home is the fact that this is a level of abstraction in which we are informed by everything that is going on in structural biology. But this representation doesn't expose those constraints. So uh, it, 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 it hides it and therefore allows us to focus really on, on process, much more so than biologists uh, used to do in the past. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think this is all. Okay. So what is this language about? So I gave you a sense of what these agents, what the abstraction is. Uh, the, formally speaking, the real, the, the objects of this language are, are graphs, are graphs of a certain kind. We call them site graphs. The site graphs because Unlike traditional graphs, uh, well, like traditional graphs, they do have nodes and links between nodes, but the links are not, uh, are not borne by the nodes themselves, but by sites that are elements of the nodes. So the nodes are sets of sites, sets, not multisets, and uh, these uh, sites bear edges, and the edges symbolize uh, binding uh, possibilities. Uh, at the same time, a site might also occur in different states, which we would call internal states, that are meant to, um, to uh, portray phosphorylation, various chemical modifications that these proteins undergo. And this is just a textual representation of a graph. I don't think there's much need to, here in this audience to, to decipher that textual notation. It's pretty obvious. It's a way of, of encoding a graph in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a string of text. So think of it as a Facebook of proteins here. You know, who, who's friend of whom? Now, this is a particular side graph. The side graphs come in two flavors. Uh, this is what we call a contact map. A contact map is a summary statement of possibilities. You may think of it as a type. In fact, it is a type. Um, where uh, the, the, the characteristic of a contact map is that each agent that might occur in my system here occurs exactly once in that map, and that each site might have more than one edge coming from it because it's an indication of possibility. It's not an indication of actuality. So actuality is uh, gotten to by another kind of side graph, which we call a pattern. So a pattern is intended to be a realizable side graph given a contact map. So this pattern has, is of that type because it, there's a homomorphism from here to there um, that, um, that respects, uh, so it tells me you know, which agent can be in my pattern. In a pattern, an agent type can occur in different instances, so there can be two kinds, two A's. So that's a concrete thing. Uh, and every site can have at most one edge, at most one link, because you can be bound only to one particular molecule on that channel, and then your, uh, your channel is busy. Um, <clears throat> so this is a realizable site graph that respects a contact map. Then there is the notion of uh, it's a pattern because the agents in this pattern may not exhibit, may not reveal all the sites they have, but only a subset of those sites. Uh, when they reveal all the sites they have, then there are sort of, they're essentially a representation of a molecular species. And we call 
a set of molecules we call a connected component in which every site reveals every sorry every agent reveals all its sites according to the contact map a molecular species or a molecule and uh, a set of so those molecules or multi set of those molecules typically a, a mixture okay so these are the concepts <clears throat> so a rule is nothing else than a before and after it's like it's a site graph rewriting system in a way uh, but it is intended so there is a before and there is an after it is intended to formalize some of these facts that I spoke of before. So this would say, well, if you, know, you have this kind of configuration locally, then uh, this bond here can dissociate. Okay, this is maybe an empirical fact. If tomorrow uh, someone comes along and says, ah, but this dissociation really can only occur if uh, there is an agency bound to be at a particular site, well, then you can modify this rule. So a rule, there, there will be many rules, because each rule is a kind of pebble of empirical temporary truth. Okay. Um, so it's a formalized mechanistic hypothesis. It mentions only that which is relevant to an interaction. Uh, and in this way, it deals elegantly with combinatorial complexity. Uh, it is abstract. It is informed by structural constraints, by what structural biologists tell us and biochemists. But it does not expose those constraints. It is just sort of, uh, it, it focuses much more on process. Uh, well, that, uh, in order to decide that, good question, in order to decide that, I would have to show you the contact map, so the type uh, of this system. Uh, I'm, I'm using the example of before. So because uh, before we have an A that is an S, uh, I think I, I use this one in the rule. So this would be a pattern because this agent A does not reveal site S, which it has in the contact map. Okay, this is, a very, this is an exceedingly simple case. Typically, these agents would have, you know, PI3 kinase has perhaps 30 sites. And you, know, you have to imagine that these, these representations here you know, would be hyperlinked to also, you click on an agent, you go to Uniprot, and it tells you, you know, what is the sequence of this agent. You click on the site, it goes to, 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 to PFAM and so forth, and tells you what is the domain, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, there's also sort of deep bioinformatic information that you can link to these, uh, to these objects. So is the assumption that when the rule applies, that everything that isn't mentioned is the same? Exactly. So the idea here, here. Uh, so this is the question that you're asking. How does a rule apply? And where does it apply? And at what rate does it apply? Well, the idea is to have, uh, you have a rule, you have a mixture that is a set of now molecular species so represented. Uh, so in the, in the mixture, every, every agent reveals all, its, all the sites it has according to, its, uh, to, the, to, the, to the contact map. And the application of a rule has now to uh, it's a pattern matching. You know, I, have, I have to see where this pattern uh, matches in this mixture. It might match in many different locations. But so it matches, for example, here. And then you, you embed, in some sense, the left-hand side into the mixture. And then you transport the action along uh, that embedding. And you do so at a rate k. So there is, each rule has associated with it an intrinsic rate of firing for a particular application instance. So let me work this out a little bit more in detail. So here we have a mixture. So suppose this is, in this case, it's a single molecule. Uh, this is a rule, the rule we had before, and it fires at rate K2. Now notice that there are two embeddings of this rule uh, of the left-hand side into the mixture. There's this embedding, and there's this embedding. I mean, there's a formal definition of embedding, but it, the intuition, I think, is clear. You respect agent type, you respect the state of the sites that are being mentioned, etc. So therefore, the transition in the mixture, so a rule really induces a reaction uh, or a particular transition uh, in the mixture. This transition would occur at twice the rate of the rule because there are two embeddings. At the same time, you know, t think of this rule here. Uh, this rule here also has two embeddings. You know, I said this embedding, yeah, you know, this A, or I twist them, but uh, the left-hand side has an automorphism, so the idea is that because it has an automorphism, you should not distinguish between these two embeddings. They're the same physical event. You can't distinguish them. So uh, you should quotient, and the transition occurs really with the rate K1, even though it has two embeddings like this rule here. So this leads to a definition of the activity of a rule in a mixture, which is sort of the likelihood, the propensity for a rule to fire, and the activity is given by, first of all, its rate constant, clearly. But then, naturally, by the 
the number of embeddings that the left-hand side of the rule has in the mixture, so there might be many places at which the pattern matches, so that's PI, P sub I, sort of it's the pattern here, it's the left-hand side of, the mix, of, of, a, of a rule, I should say, of rule I, uh, in the mixture M, uh, this is the set of mappings, and the cardinality of that set is the number of embeddings. Okay? Now I have to divide by the automorphism of the left-hand side, but it's not quite that simple, <coughs> uh, because uh, I, it's subtle, I should divide, and I'll explain this to you in a second, I should divide by the number of symmetries on the left-hand side that are preserved across the rule arrow. Because that are the those are the symmetries of the mechanism. We're interested in the symmetries of the mechanism. This is really subtle because a rule, <coughs> a rule is a statement about a mechanism. It's a statement about what you know about a mechanism. So what you say is what you have to mean. For example, uh, suppose here I have a, this clearly is a symmetric, uh, is, a, is a symmetric binding uh, in the sense that this left-hand side has a symmetry. It's a non-trivial automorphism. And when you say that, all, that this symmetry is all you need for a binding event to occur, then it, you say that the mechanism really can't distinguish between uh, the various, uh, the various <coughs> automorphic versions here of embeddings. And so the number of physical events is just a half number of the embeddings. This holds even if your embedding were to pick out an asymmetric reaction because, say, this guy embeds into, um, into a piece of your mixture at which B has some agent C hanging off, while this, ver uh, this, uh, this copy of B does not have anything hanging off. So these are two different, now the symmetry is broken in the mixture, but nonetheless, uh, the reaction will proceed. This reaction will proceed with, uh, with, uh, 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 with a rate that is the rate of the rule where the number of embeddings of the left-hand side has been divided by two, has been quotiented. Because that's what you say. You know, you say, the mechanism can't, you're asserting that the mechanism only sees what you say on the left-hand side. So the mechanism has to be blind to whatever else is hanging off the bees, even if that breaks the symmetry. That's your assertion. We have to be very careful that, you know, what, what you say is really what you mean in the rule. Uh, on the other hand, if you assert an asymmetric unbinding, for example, this is a symmetric rule, there's a symmetry here on the left-hand side, as there is a symmetry here, but the reaction, the, 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 the action is asymmetric because the product, the symmetry is not preserved across the rule arrow. Here, the symmetry of the rule is preserved. This is symmetric and this is symmetric. But here, this is symmetric, this is not symmetric, or this is symmetric and this is not symmetric. In this case, uh, both embeddings of the left-hand side uh, can, uh, are, are physical events. A way of thinking of this is that clearly there are, there are essentially two reaction centers at which something can happen. You know, this guy can attach here or it can attach here. So in some sense you could say, well, I do my quotienting by the symmetry, but then I have to multiply by two because really uh, I, uh, I have two reaction centers. So something to keep in mind. Now I'm going way over time. So uh, it's, it's a little bit, uh, I think I got out of the way in the beginning of my, of my lecture, sort of the vision. I'm now sort of digging a little bit deeper into how we're doing things. Uh, I know you're busy, so we can, we can have a, a question session now. Uh, and or, you know, I will, you, you can leave at any time. This is not a, I, I, I take it not to be a statement about about um, uh, my, my digressions here. So we will continue, but uh, please, you know, this is, uh, don't, don't feel obliged anymore. Go ahead. Okay, so, so a question. Sure. Um, is, is there any sense in which um, the rules can be inconsistent with each other? Is there any notion of inconsistency? Ah, uh, well. I mean, nature's probably consistent, yes, but I no, guess no, different experiments. Uh, like excellent it. question. That's precisely, you see, uh, uh, the rules should not be inconsistent when you are making a model, sort of within a model, model being, being uh, uh, thought of as a set of rules. The rules need to be, you know, whatever you mean by consistent. So a rule, a rule. Um, I, I suppose what no, I'm thinking he's, is that, that, that he's asking what do you mean by consistency? Yes. 
I mean, I suppose what I have in mind is that nature itself presumably is consistent, but, but you, you, you obtain your rules by experiment. Exactly. No, no. And experiments may have hidden no, right. Correct, correct. So, right. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm on the page. The, um, so let me, let me try differently. Yes, what we might know, so what you find in your lab and what I find in my lab, you know, might be, might be very different because we use different experimental techniques, we use different reagents, what have you, we, we haven't checked all the controls and so forth. So yes, so the, the empirical facts uh, will be, the factoids themselves will be inconsistent. You know, there are huge diatribes amongst you know, people in the literature you know, about, you know, no, this is not true, yes, this is true, but etc. So absolutely, those rules should be formalized, and that's the whole point of having a rule pool. A rule pool. And, and, is, and is truth measured in, in, in the sense of the, the, the predictive ability of the... Oh, it's measured in the size of the grants and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but <laughs> yes, the, 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 the um, well, you know, sometimes, well, predictability, how? You know, for, for measuring predictability, we have to make models. So therefore, which is precisely sort of this debugging uh, idea where you're claiming that rule, that this interaction between these two proteins follows rule X. I'm claiming it follows rule Y. Uh, but of course, what that means can only be assessed in the context of many other rules uh, that describe further interactions of these, uh, of these molecules in a you know, sl slightly larger system in which they're embedded. So now we make models to assess what are the consequences. And it's extremely useful to have those models assess the consequences, even if the models themselves are not really quantitatively predictive. Because, you know, qualitative consequences like, oh, this complex cannot possibly assemble if I use your rule or certain intermediates on the way to assembly would occur if you use my rules, but we have no evidence for those intermediates. So now we can start discussing and agreeing actually upon you know, what we disagree. Well, so the idea here really uh, absolutely is to have a compendium, a corpus of rules that might be contradictory with one another uh, because they just reflect what a community knows, and there is no consistency necessarily across what a community knows, neither at a, any po a given point in time nor across time. But on the other hand, if I make, um, if I take now a certain set of rules that are that are that are potential choices together into a model and say, okay, this is now the model that I'm interested in. That's a little. A snippet of a system that I'm interested in. I choose this, 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 and this, and these rules. I put them together, and now I have a little model. That choice better be consistent. Otherwise, you will get uh, you will get rules that cannot fire, or you will get um, uh, you know you will you you're not modeling what you what you are, are intending to. So is that yep. okay? So that that's precisely why we need rule pools because uh, it's it's. This is what I, you know, it's executable knowledge. It's, Jasmine has pointed out extremely well and made a very cogent case for the importance of computational models sort of as programs, as algorithms, as a new way of thinking about what is going on uh, uh, in cells from a design perspective, but from a causal perspective. But at the same time, I think we also need to have to embed this idea of executable biology, of programs as models, in, uh, uh, in a corpus of model elements, these rules, that, are, that represent empirical information <coughs> that a community can, can create, update, and curate. So let me quickly just walk through. Was there a question? Yeah, so, so it, it was a question about inconsistent rules uh, in, in, the, in the whole tool. So when rules are inconsistent, uh, maybe it, it might be good to have some sort of qualifiers with the rule that this particular lab in, in, in Harvard says that this rule is correct, and this particular lab in Berkeley says this other rule is correct. And although, um, so if the qualifiers are the same, if the rules are consistent, then you say we don't need the qualifiers. There could be a hierarchy of qualifiers, and then you say this rule is is basically overall consistent. It doesn't need a qualifier. Oh, Otherwise, it's uh, only consistent in a specific lab. Yeah, uh, uh, totally. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there is a lot of in a database of rules. There has to be a lot of annotation, uh, annotation with regard to provenance, with regard to conditions. You know, you have if you are if you are if this is a Wikipedia of rules, and you are putting in a new a new rule. Uh, 
I want to know what's your evidence. Why do you believe this rule uh, is the case? And it's not so, really a Wikipedia, is it? It's not really a Wikipedia. Uh, well, <laughs> it, it, ultimately, you would like to. You know, I, I wish there, it was a Wikipedia because you know I wish I had that, that, that level of adoption, and 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 it's perfectly fine because uh, you can have contradictory and even wrong things in there, uh, because uh, eventually, by making models and by by cross-checking this way, you will you will discover that. Uh, so yes, that's a whole challenge that I'm certainly not getting to at all, but that was sort of another part of a talk of how do we create a web infrastructure that uh, entices people to, uh, to do exactly what you said. So, so I'm basically looking at the problem from a machine learning uh, perspective. And from a machine learning perspective, it might be uh, th there is a problem there in the framework that if there are certain qualifiers with the rules, how do you actually merge these qualifiers and come up with new qualifiers saying, now we have a rule which is consistent overall under this qualifier, under this new qualifier? Point taken, yeah. So it's, it's, this is just, <laughs> the real problem starts now. You know, how do we make exactly these kinds of things? What technology should we bring to bear to, make a, to, to watch over a rule pool and alert us to when things are, are, are inconsistent with one another? Absolutely. Yeah, that's subject. Sure. Are rules typically yes, validated individually or through models? So do you know that you know, we have these, uh, we have evidence that these three rules, uh, we ought to have these three rules because that explains this thing that happens. Exactly, yes. Or can, or, or can you usually yeah. test any given rules? No, I, uh, rules, rules will typically be tested. Sort of, it's, it's a more an anthropological observation you know, of how, how people proceed. Uh, it, they will be tested in uh, models that, uh, in, in, in context. So very often, uh, a rule itself is just a, a piece of process. And so you typically are interested in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a little bigger story, not the whole system perhaps at, you know, right away, but in a little chunk. And so you need to see whether the rule, given other rules that have been proposed before, uh, how it collaborates with these other rules to bring about the phenomenon that you're interested in. So the, 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 the assessment of an individual rule would go back to what, what, what your colleague said, you know, would be about, would eventually have to refer to the biochemical experiments that people did and how much you trust that measurement, et cetera. That's sort of an individual rule. But then whether a rule is, whether the, the, the that can also be then assessed in terms of how, whether the rules behaves correctly in context of other rules. Sorry, Tony. Yes, uh, um, I speak from the point of view of program verification. So I'm interested whether you envisage higher level rules in which you could express the hypotheses which your particular common experiment is trying to test. So that later on you can conduct higher level experiments using these um, verified rules um, that uh, somebody else has uh, assembled for you. Uh, yes, in this case, the rules uh, presumably would be sort of uh, would be uh, uh, suitably uh, statements expressed in some suitable logic uh, that asserts uh, something about the behavior of the system. Why don't you use the same language the same? logic that you're using for, uh, for your lower level rules? Um. I mean, you, you did, the, the language in which he expressed his theorems is the same language in which his postulates. Uh, are expressed. But uh, the uh, where I'm having difficulty with that is that the properties I'm usually thinking of are properties in which time figures, right? So, uh, for example, at uh, uh, before this event has to happen before another event can occur, for example. Uh, or uh, this is the molecular workflow, the, the event structure, you would say, perhaps in concurrency, of how this particular observable uh, uh, comes about in 95% of the cases. Statements of this kind. So uh, how to represent statements of this sort in this language where you have a side graph on the left and the side graph on the right is, um, is, is not, not uh, in, is, is not, I don't see that at the moment. But, uh, but I take your, I take your, 
your point. Um, it, quite, yeah, the question is whether one could, uh, whether one could, yeah. But, um, so... That's a computer science question, too. I mean, I know that, I know that a number of people here are, uh, you know, in, in, in Jasmine's and in, in Lucas' uh, uh, and in Andrews, when you go to synthetic biology realms, are, are concerned with precisely uh, program verification or model checking in, in expressing certain properties of interest to biologists, but now in a, in a, in a language that differs uh, possibly. Well, in, in, in this representation, it would be a language that differs from, from the, the language in which you describe the, the microscopic interactions. But maybe Jasmine has a, has a, has a representation of the system itself that is at a different level and that allows what you're saying. So that's, I'm, I'm, I can't, uh, that's the question to her probably. I think uh, just a comment on that. Sure. Now, Uber is working on a language along those lines where you specify the rules and the hypothesis in the same formalism. One of the drawbacks is to get um, inconsistency between the rules because of the way that they, that they've been specified in a much more general manner. So you could have uh, some inconsistencies and then form formal verification to detect those inconsistencies. Well, that's essentially it. You can express the high level hypotheses and the low level interaction mechanisms in the same temporal logic. I mean, I could, I could see hypotheses of the kind where you say, uh, let's go back to, uh, uh, well, I'm just popping up some rule, uh, where you are, where, where this arrow is really meant with a star somehow, that uh, given, if you start out with a state of this kind, then eventually, you know, you end up after sort of many things have happened in, in, you eventually enable this action. Uh, perhaps that is, that, that's the way of thinking about it. I mean, again, I'm not a computer scientist, so I'm, I'm trying to sort of decipher what you have in mind, but uh, typically what I would like, in order for this framework to be powerful, the rules really ought to be as mechanistic as possible, as detailed as possible. So I would like to, you know, there would be no point in having a rule that says, uh, on this side, lots of damage, and on this side, cell death. Uh, that lots of damage goes into cell death. Well, yes, but, you know, I'm, the whole problem, the whole point is exactly to understand how that is, um, is, uh, is happening by microscopic interactions. So the more microscopic these interactions are, the less phenomenal, the less sort of, uh, aggregating they are, the better, the better it is. But it looks like you have like a, a long, like laundry list of rules that apply all at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. but, and, I mean, in, in CS, you have languages where the set of rules kind of evolves over time. So as, as you enter a new phase, you get a new bunch of reactions that are enabled, and then they might go away depending on whether the, kind of the agents are publicly visible uh, or not. Right. This, is, this all would be possible to represent in here, definitely, because you might have rules that only start firing at, at a later time because the conditions for the firing is met only at a later time. Do uh, No. No, I don't think so. so. I think the proposal is you have explicit stages in the rules rather than have hammers of rules that are all conditioned on the concentration of something else being at a certain level. Or you you see that, that well, you see, that, that is what I would like to avoid in a way. That's a bit ambitious because that conditioning, so the, the risk here is, the, the name of the game here is not to make, not to think of modeling as phenomenology imitation. You know, the point is not to create a model that, 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 is, that is just, that tracks some data, because I, I, can, I, can, I can make up any model that tracks, you know, give me, give me some, you know, that's, that's, that's overfitting or so. I, if you have, if you think that there's a mechanism in your system in which you, the application of a rule is dependent or th there's a concentration effect, that concent you have to explain that concentration effect. You can't assume it. You can't just put it in and build it into a kind of aggregate rate law. In the, in the, many people use, use rate laws in, in chemical kinetics that have you know strongly non strong nonlinearities like sigmoids uh, or 
or, or other functions of that kind. When you, when you do that, uh, you effectively give them a very powerful modeling language in which they can tweak the parameters and make the model a causally, mechanistically wrong model behave correctly uh, at any time. So that's, that's the big problem we have that, that we, we... Right, you can, you can start... So you want really... The exercise here is really to, 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 to be... to let the data speak directly by, by coating it sort of in an executable, uh, by dressing it up executably so that, that it, data about interaction start interacting. And, and so um, eventually you might get to higher levels of description which you aggregate over the rules and you sort of switch to a different language altogether. You switch to a language of differential equations and sort of higher order um, uh, rate laws. But that should be justified. So what, what I'm arguing with is that the, the models, there should be a process of simplification. We all are for simplification. I'm not saying that we need to have sort of one inch, one inch. Uh, we, we, we want to make maps that eventually boil down to the essence. But that's a process that can only start with first representing the complex and then in a systematic way uh, simplifying rather than having models born simply already because that's only just only, only prejudice. Uh, I don't know. The, I don't want to go too much into uh, further. But you, you can imagine from, as computer scientists can imagine much better than biologists, uh, what you can do with programs at this point. There are, there are lots of, uh, you can exhibit the causal connections between rules. That is, you can draw a network in which each node is a rule and, a, and an arrow between one rule and another rule signifies uh, the fact that a rule may, that there exists a state of the world such that the firing of rule A uh, enables the firing of rule B. In this case, sort of A causes B, or in which it um, competes, it with, in which it takes away instances from rule B, in which case A sort of inhibits rule B because any firing of A or any firing of B will deplete instances for the other. So that's a, a kind of, of rule influence map that you can build a static concept. Of course, you need simulators. Uh, many people here are familiar with uh, sort of uh, stochastic chemical kinetics you know, from stochastic pi calculus, Luca, for example, uh, and Andrew. So um, um, there, is, there are interesting opportunities here for understanding causality. Uh, when, you, uh, when you look at these systems, uh, what people do when they simplify it's sort of an interesting diagram that you, f that, that you often find, interesting diagrams you often find on whiteboards in laboratories when, you know, this is, this is really taken literally from, uh, from, a, from such a, in this case, a, a paper pad someone scratched on, uh, when reasoning about a particular signaling system. And that, in fact, was the signaling system of the co complicated diagram I showed before. So there's an interesting top-to-bottom layout of this diagram, which in the minds of the biologists sort of suggest a progression, a kind of a storyline. Things that happen early are on top. And then something happens, and then you sort of progress. So there's a time axis here somehow. Uh, so if you're interested in this kind of observable, then something has to happen before, then something next that enables something further, and so on. Uh, these are sort of the forward, this, this suggests this layout, a partition into two kinds of arrows. The arrows that go from top towards the bottom, so these are forward steps, these are elements of causality of some kind. But then they also have backward steps. These backward steps can't possibly be elements of causality because, you know, what you want to explain already has to have happened for those uh, uh, things to become effective. These are sort of more elements of kinetics. They say when you already have got what you're looking for, when your observable has been discovered in the system, now, it, it turn can feed back and make more of itself in a dramatic way by these kinds of feedbacks. So uh, there's, there's a way of automatically disentangling these two kinds of things by precisely applying ideas from event structures, and we're working with Glenn Vinskill here across uh, on this, uh, where you can, you make a simulation, you record all your events that are in, introduced by, induced by rules, you stop your simulation when an observable of interest has occurred, and then you reconstruct out of that set of events, those that were necessary in obtaining, uh, uh, in obtaining that observable, you, you, you display them as a DAG, as a directed acyclic graph, 
Uh, and so now you have the causal structure that was, necess that was, uh, that was responsible for the occurrence of that observable in that particular run. You do this now many, many times in the hope to accrue statistics over different such uh, causal structures, and essentially you, you get sort of the pathways, what people would call the pathways, uh, the different ways of obtaining that observable in a given system of rules. And then you can start comparing, you know, which of these pathways have, um, have um, you know, what portions are identical, what portions differ, and that already allows you to make predictions. When you knock out a rule uh, because you now modify a protein, you modify a gene, so that a particular rule does not become, is, is ineffective, does that eliminate all the pathways or does it eliminate uh, only some? If it is occurring in all the pathways, then it should eliminate the observable altogether. And that's a, a, a something you can test. Uh, at the same time, because such a diagram is a diagram in which each of the nodes is a rule, and it just says, you know, everything that has, things have, can happen here in any order. When they have happened, this can happen, and so on. Because this diagram has rules as nodes, and because we have an influence map that tells us statically already which rule has a positive or a negative influence on which other rule, we can start asking, does this rule have a positive influence on a rule up, upstream in this causal diagram? And if so, now we have discovered a feedback. So this is, uh, you know, this is a particular test case uh, where you have such a causal diagram to this observable, and then you discover this observable is a rule. You discover that this rule has a positive, in this case, has a negative influence on a rule upstream. And so you have discovered a negative feedback, and in fact, this is a reason why the system oscillates. Uh, I, think, I think I will, I will just stop here because you know, I'm way over time. There are a number of technically very interesting issues that we have not touched upon, and I'd be more than happy to give sort of a, uh, a more technical seminar on any one of them um, if, uh, if you are so interested. But I hope you've gotten the sense of part of the story, at least, what is really left out from a very practical point of view, which we were focusing on right now, is precisely the question that has arisen before, is how to... Um, how to sort of cognitive ergonomics, if you wish, you know, cognitive design, you know, how do you produce a platform, uh, a web infrastructure and associated web services that, um, uh, that allow special interest groups in biology that are interested in this or that signaling system to, to collate rules. This whole process of going from reading literature whether you read it or whether a program reads it, you know, some, some, some language, some natural language processing, uh, or mining various databases that exist. In going from the information we have out there that is mostly verbal when it comes to interaction to a distillation of these formal, uh, to a formal expression of this kind or a related kind, you know, it's, I'm not religious about this particular language. Um, <clears throat> That is, that's not a trivial process because it has, it involves certain steps that are, there are certain chunks of information that are eventually required to design these rules. But how you go to the, uh, how you, how you, how you, how you distill those chunks of information is mostly free form. You know, you do it differently than I do it. You might read the papers in a different sequence than I do them. I read them, so you might come up with, uh, how to organize that is, I think, a, a challenge, but a challenge we have to, we have to meet because the opportunities are just uh, intellectually and, and in some sense uh, practically are, are just sheer enormous. So, um, you know, I leave you with that thought. If you have any ideas uh, of how to do that, uh, or if you want to compare notes, I'm, I'm available at all times. So thank you for, <coughs> for your patience, and I really apologize for having been so inconsiderate. But you have been staying. I told you that. Okay. <laughs>